Ye shall pray for Christ's holy Catholic Church, and especially for the Anglican Communion, for our Sovereign Lord King Charles, for the ministers of God's holy word and sacraments, as well as archbishops and bishops and other pastors and curates, for the King's most honourable council, and for all the nobility and magistrates, that all and every of these in their several callings may serve truly and painfully to the glory of God and the edifying and governing of his people. Also, ye shall pray for the whole commons of this realm, that they may live in the true faith and fear of God and in brotherly charity one to another. Finally, let us praise God for all those which are departed out of this life in the faith of Christ and pray unto God that we may have grace to direct our lives after their good examples, that this life ended, we may be partakers with them of the glorious resurrection in the life everlasting. Let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Although there want not good Christian people, great swarms of vice is worthy to be rebuked. Under such decay is true godliness and virtuous living now come. Yet above other vices in outrageous seas of adultery or breaking of wedlock, boredom, fornication, and uncleanness have not only brassed in, but also overflowed almost the whole world unto the great dishonor of God and exceeding infamy of the name of Christ, the notable decay of true religion and the utter destruction of the public wealth, and that so abundantly that through the customal use thereof this vice is grown into such a height that in any in a manner among many, it is counted no sin at all, but rather a pastime, a dalliance, and but a touch of youth, not rebuked, but winked at, not punished, but laughed at. Wherefore it is necessary at this present to entreat of the sin of whoredom and fornication, declaring unto you the greatness of this sin, and how odious, hateful, and abominable it is, and hath always been reputed before God and all good men, and how grievously it hath been punished both by the law of God and the laws of diverse princes. Again, to show you certain remedies whereby ye may, through the grace of God, eschew this most detestable sin of whoredom and fornication, and lead your lives in all honesty and cleanness, and that ye may perceive that fornication and whoredom are in the sight of God most abominable sins. Ye shall call to remembrance this commandment of God, that thou shalt not commit adultery. By the which word adultery, although it be properly understand of the unlawful commixing or joining together of a married man with any woman beside his wife, or of a wife with any man beside her husband. Yet thereby is signified also all unlawful use of those parts which be ordained for generation. And this one commandment forbidding adultery doth sufficiently paint and set out before our eyes the greatness of this sin of whoredom, and manifestly declareth how greatly it ought to be aboard of all honest and faithful persons, and that none of us shall think himself except from this commandment, whether we be old or young, married or unmarried, man or woman, hear what God the Father saith by his most excellent prophet Moses. There shall be no whore among the daughters of Israel, nor no whoremonger among the sons of Israel. Here is whoredom, fornication, and all uncleanness forbidden to all kinds of people, all degrees and all ages without exception. And that we shall not doubt but that this precept or commandment pertaineth to us indeed. Hear what Christ, the perfect teacher of all truth, saith in the New Testament. Ye have heard, saith Christ, that it was said to them of the old time, 
thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, whosoever seeth a woman to have his lust of her, hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Here our Saviour Christ doth not only confirm and establish the law against adultery given in the Old Testament of God the Father by his servant Moses, and maketh it of full strength continually to remain among the professors of his name in the new law, but he also condemning the gross interpretation of the scribes and Pharisees, which taught that the aforesaid commandment only required to abstain from the outward adultery and not from the filthy desires and unpure lusts, teacheth us an exact and full perfection of purity and cleanness of life, both to keep our bodies undefiled and our hearts pure and free from all evil thoughts, carnal desires and fleshly consents. How can we then be free from this commandment where so great charge is laid upon us? May a servant do what he will in anything, having a commandment of his master to the contrary. Is not Christ our master? Are not we his servants? How then may we neglect our master's will and pleasure and follow our own will and fantasy? Ye are my friends, saith Christ, if you keep those things that I command you. Now that hath Christ our master commanded us that we should forsake all uncleanness and lurchery both in body and spirit, this therefore must we do if we look to please God. In the Gospel of St. Matthew, we read that the scribes and Pharisees were grievously offended with Christ because his disciples did not keep the traditions of the forefathers, for they washed not their hands when they went to dinner or supper. And among other things, Christ answered and said, Hear and understand, not that thing which entereth into the mouth defileth the man, but that which cometh out of the mouth defileth the man. For those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murder, breaking of wedlock, whoredom, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. Here may we see that not only murder, theft, false witness and blasphemy defile men, but also evil thoughts, breaking of wedlock, fornication and whoredom. Who is now of so little wit that he will esteem whoredom and fornication to be things of small importance and of no weight before God? Christ, which is the truth and cannot lie, saith that evil thoughts, breaking of wedlam, whoredom and fornication defile a man, that is to say, corrupt both the body and soul of man and make them of the temples of the Holy Ghost, the filthy dunghill or dungeon of all unclean spirits of the house of God at the dwelling place of Satan. Again, in the Gospel of St. John, when the woman taken in adultery was brought unto Christ, said not he unto her, Go thy way and sin no more. Doth not he here call whoredom sin? And what is the reward of sin but everlasting death? If whoredom be sin, then it is not lawful for us to commit it. For St. John saith, He that committeth sin is of the devil. And our Saviour saith, Every one that committeth sin is the servant of sin. If whoredom had not been sin, surely St. John the Baptist would never have rebuked King Herod for taking his brother's wife. But he told him plainly that it was not lawful for him to take his brother's wife. He winked not at that whoredom of Herod, although he were a king of great power, but boldly reproved him for his wicked and abominable living, although for the same he lost his head. But he would rather suffer death than see God so dishonoured by the breaking of his holy precept or commandment, than to suffer whoredom to be unrebuked, even in a king. If whoredom had been but a pastime, a dalliance, and a thing not to be passed of, as many count it nowadays, truly John had been more than twice mad. If he would have had the displeasure of a king, if he would have been cast into prison and lost his head for a trifle, but John knew right well how filthy, stinking, and abominable the sin of whoredom is in the sight of God. Therefore would not he leave it unrebuked? No, not in a king. If whoredom be not lawful in a king, neither is it lawful in a subject. If whoredom not be lawful, be not lawful in a public or common officer, neither is it lawful in a private person. If it be not lawful neither in a king nor subject, neither in common officer nor private person, truly then it is not lawful in no man nor woman of whatsoever degree or age they be. 
Furthermore, in the Acts of the Apostles, we read that when the apostles and elders with the whole congregation were gathered together to pacify the hearts of the faithful dwelling at Antioch, which were disquieted through the false doctrine of certain Jewish preachers, they sent word to the brethren that it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to them to charge them with no more than with necessary things among others. They willed them to abstain from idolatry and fornication, from which said they, if ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well. Note here how these holy and blessed fathers of Christ's church would charge the congregation with no more things than were necessary. Mark also how among those things from which they commanded the brethren of Antioch to abstain. Fornication and whoredom is numbered. It is therefore necessary by the determination and consent of the Holy Ghost and the apostles and elders with the whole congregation that as from idolatry and superstition, so likewise we must abstain from fornication and whoredom. It is necessary unto salvation to abstain from idolatry. So it is to abstain from whoredom. Is there any nigher way to lead unto damnation? than to be an idolater. No, even so, neither is there a nearer way to damnation than to be a fornicator and a whoremonger. Now, where are those people which so lightly esteem breaking of wedlock, whoredom, fornication, and adultery? It is necessary, saith the Holy Ghost, the blessed apostles, the elders of the whole congregation of Christ. It is necessary to salvation, say they, to abstain from whoredom. If it be necessary unto salvation, then woe be to them which, neglecting their salvation, give their minds to so filthy and stinking sin, to so wicked vice, to so detestable abomination.